Good morning, friends. <laughs> Hello. Um, thank you for joining us today as we continue on in our Advent series as we're talking about the tension of pain and joy today. I'm really grateful to, to be here to be able to, to share in this series. Um, I just love everything about the Christmas season. I love um, looking at lights. I love decorating the house. I love the Christmas music. Um, I love all the, the celebrations that come along with it. And I love decorating the tree each year. And I really love especially getting the real tree. Like that's, that's an important part of the experience for me. Um, I love getting to go pick out the tree and bringing it home and decorating it and having that smell of pine in the house um, for the next few weeks. My husband, on the other hand, doesn't understand that this is part of the experience. He doesn't share my enthusiasm for, for all things Christmas. And so we have this debate in our home every year about the real tree or the fake tree. He would prefer to have the fake tree because it's less mess and less work. He just doesn't get that it's part of this whole magical experience. Um, but, but luckily, because he loves me, he normally indulges me because he knows how much it means to me. And so this year, um, one of my Christmas dreams came true and we actually got to go to a real Christmas tree farm and pick Ooh. out our tree. And you know, growing up in Arizona and then living in Orange County all my adult life, I didn't know that this was an experience that was available to me. So it was really, I was so excited when I found out that there's actually a Christmas tree lot in Brea, just up the road. And so we were able to go and have the whole experience, you know, walking through the live trees, picking out the right one, and, and Matt actually got to cut it down himself. Um, and even though it was, it was 80 degrees and sunny and we were like sweating the whole time, it was still this magical experience. At least for me. <laughs> I, I realized though, looking back, um, when we were getting out of the car at the Christmas tree farm, I had said something to my family along the lines of like, okay, there's, there's no grumpiness allowed, there's no whining, like we're gonna enjoy this, this is gonna be a magical experience. And I realized that because I, I love all the Christmas season festivities and, and I want everything to be merry and bright, um, I often, in the midst of it, I don't really create space for my family to express any other emotions. Right? It's not that I want them to fake it, like I really want them to be happy with me <laughs> and to enjoy the experience. And so we see in the Christmas season, there's often all, this, um, all this, these festivities that really, that's not the joy that we talk about in this Advent season. That's really manufactured merriment. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like I said, I, I love that. It brings me lots of happy feelings. Um, but there's nothing lasting about that. And if we just focus on that manufactured merriment, it's gonna end up being pretty empty. It's gonna be a distraction from what this Christmas season is really all about. Or we're gonna have these, these high expectations of what the experience is supposed to be like. And if, if anything goes wrong, we're left disappoint, disappointed. And at the end of the season, we pack up all the decorations and we put it away and we just sink back into our reality. And there's nothing lasting about that. But that is why I love Advent. Because Advent is where all the Christmas cheer meets the struggle of our everyday life. It's where that sweet baby Jesus in the manger meets our current reality. And we can be honest that our current reality is pretty far from that Christmas cheer. It's been a hard year. It's been a year that's been marked by a lot of pain and loss for a lot of people. You know, there are people who have lost loved ones in the midst of this pandemic, people dealing with sickness, people who have lost jobs and income, and all of us who have just lost our normal way of doing things. And I think specifically of, of the medical professionals in our community, and we have seen them as they have struggled each day going to work. <laughs> we've, seen, we've seen that pain as they are caring for their COVID patients, seeing them suffering, seeing the death. This season right now is marked by a lot of pain. We see these dismal circumstances. But if we look back on Jesus's birth, we see that that came in the midst of some pretty dismal circumstances as well. When Jesus's birth was announced, the Jewish people had been living under foreign occupation and oppression for generations. 
They were waiting for someone to come and rescue them out of their pain. And I'm sure that they felt like God had just been silent for so many years. I'm sure they wondered if God had just forgotten about them. But it was in the midst of these circumstances that Jesus' birth was announced. And we read in Luke 2, 10 through 11, as the angels come and proclaim Jesus' birth to the shepherds, they say, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This was cause for great joy. And we see that joy in the midst of the people who heard about Jesus' birth. We see it in the shepherds who were so excited that they left their sheep and ran to find this baby Jesus. We see it in Simeon, a devout man who spent his time in the temple. And he had been waiting his whole life for this Savior to be born. And once he hears the news of Jesus' birth and he sees him, he says, I can die in peace. Like my life has reached fulfillment because I have seen the coming of our Savior. We see it in the Magi who were overjoyed when they saw this star in the sky. These men were not even Jewish. They were astronomers from, from another country in the East. But they saw this star and they knew that it was important. They knew that it was cause for celebration. So they traveled all those miles to find this baby Jesus so that they could celebrate. And the reason that all these people had so much joy is because they knew the promises that God had given about this baby. He was this Messiah that they had been waiting for. He was the rescuer. So there was joy over this promise that had been fulfilled. And yet their circumstances didn't change. The oppression and occupation didn't end with Jesus' birth. There ended up being a genocide after Jesus' birth because Herod couldn't stand the thought of this baby king, and he was threatened, and he, he ordered that, that all the baby boys would be killed. And so the Holy Family became refugees. They had to flee for their lives. They escaped in the middle of the night to Egypt so that they could protect their baby. And yet, even though Jesus' birth didn't change things right away, and even though they were still in the midst of these painful circumstances, they still knew that they had cause for great joy. And that's because this promised Redeemer and Savior was not just about changing their circumstances, but it was this sign of God's love for them. This was a sign of God's kindness and mercy in the midst of their pain. This was a sign that God had not forgotten about them, but that he saw them in their pain and he sent someone to come and to take the wrong things and make them right. He had come, God himself had come and he was present with them in the midst of their pain. And so they rejoiced because Jesus's birth reminded them of all the good that God had done for them in the past. It reminded them that God was present with them right now in their pain. And it promised that he would continue to heal and restore. And so their joy was found in the recognition of God's love and presence and goodness. And that is the source of our joy as well. When we talk about the joy we have in Christ, it's not that manufactured merriment of the Christmas season. And it's not about our circumstances lining up just right. But joy is deeper and richer and more transcendent than all that. We have joy because we know that God is with us in the waiting and in the pain and in our grieving. We know that God will not let this pain last forever, that he is going to continue to heal and restore. And we know that God is good. We can see his goodness even in the midst of our circumstances. And yet we have to be intentional about seeking and acknowledging God's love and presence and goodness. Because there's times that it's hard to see 
especially when we're in the midst of our pain, sometimes we might just focus on all the things that are wrong. Henry Nouwen wrote, joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. It is a choice based on the knowledge that we belong to God and have found in God our refuge and our safety and that nothing, not even death, can take God away from us. I have to give some credit to, to Tom Cho because I saw, I saw him post part of that quote on, on Instagram and so I had to look it up because it was so good. Um, but it's, it's true, we have to be intentional about seeking joy. We have to look for it. We need to sit with God and ask him to show us his goodness in the midst of our pain. We need to be able to remember what he's done in the past and trust that he's gonna continue to work out his goodness and kindness in the future. And it's important to recognize that this joy does not mean that we are always happy. I once had someone tell me that if we have Jesus in our lives, that we never have to have a bad day. And that just didn't ring true for me. It felt empty. I understand the sentiment behind it, but the idea that just because we have Jesus that that, that we're not going to go through the, the gamut of emotions, that we're not going to experience pain and frustration and anger is just not true. I think that sometimes we hear these verses like, rejoice in the Lord always and give thanks in all circumstances. And sometimes in the church, we feel like that means that, that we have to be happy all the time, that, that we can never complain, that we have to pretend like everything is okay and make sure that we're always showing how grateful we are. And sometimes we see the other side of that, where there might be an acknowledgement of the pain and the brokenness that we live in, but there's just this focus on, oh, but one day we're gonna be in heaven and we won't have that anymore. So it's like this idea that because we know where we're going, the pain that people experience right here and now on earth, it doesn't really matter. But neither of those expressions get to the heart of joy. It's true that we have a lot to be grateful for right now. And it's true that someday we will experience this joy in full. That is part of the now and not yet of God's kingdom. But joy does not ignore or cancel out our pain. Pain is part of the human experience, and it's part of our spiritual experience, too. And we see that all throughout Scripture. We've got Psalms of Lament. We've got the Book of Lamentations, a whole book devoted to lament. We see it in the story of Job as, as he's arguing with God and, and, and asking why he would allow such pain. And even after Jesus arrives on the scene, we still continue to see this mourning. In Matthew 5.4, Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. In Romans 12, 15, Paul says, rejoice with those re who rejoice, but also mourn with those who mourn. And I think we especially see it so clearly in the life of Jesus. He modeled for us this tension of joy and pain. We see him weeping over Lazarus, his friend who had died. We see him weeping over Jerusalem, as he considers the, the pain and destruction that's been caused by their sin. And we see Jesus as he's in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is agonizing over the torture and the death that is to come, and he's begging God to take it away. So for me, verses like these are so freeing, because we see that Jesus felt pain and he allowed himself to grieve. And so if Jesus, the one who knows what is to come, he knows the glory and the joy that awaits him, that awaits his creation, if even he can weep and grieve and beg God to take away his pain, then it's okay for us to do that too. We have the freedom to feel what we feel. Joy doesn't mean that we have to stuff down our emotions, that we have to pretend like everything's okay, or that we have to focus just on the silver lining. The joy of the Lord is much deeper than that, and it holds space for pain. 
And in fact, I think it is necessary for joy that you do hold space for pain. Brene Brown writes that when we numb the dark, we numb the light, which is to say that we can't just numb the bad feelings. When we open our heart up to joy, we also open it up to the risk of pain. But when we try to suppress the pain, we actually cut ourselves off from the joy as well. At the end of Jesus' life, he gives his disciples this really beautiful image of what the tension of pain and joy looks like as he prepares them for his death. In John 16, 20 to 22, Jesus says, Very truly I tell you, you will weep and mourn, but the world will rejoice. You will have pain, but your pain will turn into joy. When a woman is in labor, she has pain because the, her hour has come. But when her child is born, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. So you have pain now, but I will see you again, and your hearts will rejoice, and no one will take your joy from you. In this illustration of childbirth, this really resonates with me because I've had that experience. I've given birth to two children, and one of those was with pain medication and the other one was not, and unfortunately it was the nine pound baby that was without pain medication but I made it through. And so I've, I've seen in the midst of childbirth, there, there really is pain and joy going hand in hand. They're connected in that experience. There is intense pain, pain like I've never felt before. And there comes a moment, or maybe many moments within childbirth where you feel like it's just too intense and you're not sure if you can go on. You're not sure if you have the strength to make it through. But there's also this joy in knowing that very soon that you are going to see your child when you have been waiting for nine months for this child that's growing inside of you and you're imagining what they're going to look like. You're imagining what their personality is going to be like. You imagine holding them in your arms. And you're finally at that point where you're about to, to see that in fulfillment. And it is that joy that helps you get through the pain. And yet you can't ignore the pain, right? There are things, that, techniques that you, you might have to help you manage the pain, but you can't ignore it. It is there and it is intense and it is real. But the interesting thing about pain in childbirth is that it's actually the pain that leads you. Because that pain isn't constant, it comes in waves. Right? With each contraction, there's the pain. And that pain is your body's way of telling you that it is time to push. You have to push into the pain. And when you do, when you push through that pain, you get to experience this immense joy on the other side. It is an incredible moment when that child comes out and they put that child on your chest. And this child that you have been hoping for and waiting for and dreaming of is finally there. It's an incredible experience. You know, it says in verse 21 that, that when her, her child is born, she no longer remembers the anguish because of the joy of having brought a human being into the world. And it's interesting, that idea of, of that she doesn't remember the pain because it's not like you just forget that pain. You know, I, it's five and a half years later, I remember that pain. And, and even in that moment of, of immense joy, there's still pain and there's more pain to come. And the pain leaves its mark. But that idea of not remembering it is that that pain no longer has a hold on you. And you know that it won't last forever. And so I think that the lesson <laughs> that we have in this illustration that Jesus gives of childbirth, is that we can actually let the pain lead us into the joy of God's presence. So you don't have to ignore the pain. Instead of fighting against it, you can choose to push into the pain. 
And you can actually let that pain lead you into God's presence. And as you push into God's presence, that is where you will find the joy. We're going to go right now into our breakout groups, and I have a few reflection questions um, for you guys to think through, to discuss. Um, the questions are, first, what pain are you experiencing right now? What would it look like for you to push into the pain and let it lead you into God's presence? And how are you experiencing the joy of God's presence, love, and goodness in the midst of your pain? <laughs>